Hello, this is Mary from Casing the Cover, and as library brats, my co-host Jen and I happen across numerous crappy covers, atrocious authors, sad titles, and the occasional masterpiece. We spend an unhealthy amount of time decoding how cover designs can be humorously contrary to the story within, and how publishers lure unsuspecting readers. Should you judge a book by the cover? Join Mary and Jen on the case to find out. Hello! Welcome to another episode of Casing the Cover! We're out of ideas. It's harder for me to come up with intros when I didn't read the book. Anyway, I'm Mary. This is Jen. We're on quarantine. No, we're not on quarantine anymore. We just don't see each other. Yeah, well, we see each other at the library. We see each other at the library. See, the, um, we just don't have our sneaky recording space anymore, so we have to record from home. On Zoom. Yes, yes, which means I get to look at Mary's beautiful craft room, yes. and she gets to look at my sci-fi room. That isn't really my sci-fi room. I'm going to go with it's my husband's sci-fi room because this is pretty much all his stuff. Yes. Uh, there's very little in here that's mine. <laughs> but I have the library. Like the library in the house is my room because like it's all my stuff. Your current view is the only thing in here that isn't mine. Oh. This wall of stuff is Maggie's. That's interesting. We're both looking at walls that are not our own. Yeah. That's kind of cool. So what are we talking about today, Jen? It's more science fiction. You made me record two episodes in a row. Yes, we are recording two episodes in a row. So reference back, please, to the Doubt Not the Stars episode. Yes. Because I'm going to talk a lot about it in reference to this one for a right. bunch of different reasons. Because these books are kind of similar in what they talk about. Uh, also, the two ladies that write them, I am a bit of a fangirl for. I'm going to confess, I'm more of a fangirl for Emily than Susan. Susan McElleran, I, I've read now one of her books, and I think she's great because she owns a bookstore, and I used to own an uh, online bookstore, so like I have a passion for people like that. We're kindred and spirits. Are, yes, we are kindred spirits. Uh, Emily, uh, we are kind of way closer with Emily than you think. Emily Devonport is also a local to Arizona author. She lives here in Phoenix. She runs in our convention circles. She runs in convention circles. And I've been, it's been a pleasure to be on panels with her. Uh, and to me, she's one of those big league authors that I get to kind of share a space with. And I get all like fangirl. Okay, so there are movie stars that get geeked out by other movie stars. I'm that author. I get geeked out by other authors. I'm not cool enough to be them. Not to like rat you out, Jen, but never do I see Jen get so like imposter syndrome as when she is told to be on a panel. <laughs> yes. You kind of like don't know how to handle being on a panel with some of these people, which is ridiculous because you've done just as much good work as any of them have. But every time you're on a panel with these people, you're like, um, I don't know. Ask Emily. <laughs> I really do. Because I, I get starstruck. Because in my head, I am still this small town girl. Yes, even though I live here. Even though she lives in the exact same place as Emily Davenport. I know. I live in the same exact place as Emily Davenport. I absolutely love her. I live in the exact same place as Beth Cato. All of these people... And yet I am still small town Jen who used to like dream of hanging out with these authors while I'm sitting in the middle of the swamp reading these books. Like <laughs> go to the same conventions, you're on the same panels, you live in the same city, you've written like the same number of books. That's kind of true. <laughs> all of these things. Yes, all of this. And and yet she's big leagues to me. I get it. I would do the same thing as you. I just like, it, it kind of, it's not really funny. I shouldn't laugh. It's just kind of like, I don't know. Maybe I feel bad like I, that you get like, so like, I am no one. I am no one. They I make you, really, they make you nervous. They it's make like, me so nervous. Yeah. I'm like, I can't, I'm not an A list star. I am this D list wannabe who, who loves to write will never be as cool as them. And I'm okay with that. I, I will continue to write and not be as cool as them and sit on panels and just gush. And this is the, this is the same woman that like, just like will BS with George R. R. Martin and it, at conventions and just be like nonchalant about it. Yes. And well, and he doesn't remember who I am. And like, yes, I, I will go down in history as the person, I'm going to wait till you stop drinking. 
shall I say this? Um, I mean, <laughs> go down in history as the person who grabbed Terry Pratchett's butt. See? But like, <laughs> See? But like, I don't know. There's just something in me. Anyway, that's my gush. That's my, my picky count. <laughs> let's talk about her book. <laughs> yes. That's what this is really about. So, so let's just put out there, Emily Davenport, if you're listening. I don't know. I think she follows us on Twitter. <laughs> she might be. Um, if you're listening, if you're listening, know that you make Jen Geek out more than George R. R. Martin or Terry Pratchett. Just know where you are on that list. Yes, yes. I get more nervous about talking to her than yes. This is very true. Um, and and I do I like I'm I'm friends with her on Facebook, and I still don't like. I don't I don't know. It's a thing. I'm almost to this level with Avli. And the only reason I think I'm not this geeky with Avali is because she's been in my house and has seen the dust on my floor. Like, like I think that's the only reason why I'm not quite as, like, I don't know. It, she's not quite as godlike because she's been in my house. I don't know. But she still is. Like, she's an absolute goddess. Um, but anyway. Jen hangs out with a lot of goddesses. Ew, I love them all. I don't know what to do with myself. All right. So I'm going to show you the cover of this one. This time on my phone, because I, I I read the ebook of this one, so which means I read it a lot faster. This one is very sci-fi. She looks like a robot. Yes, there's so much robots in this. So Medusa Uploaded is the first in the Medusa cycle, and I'm absolutely going to read Medusa in the Graveyard because I'm so excited about where this is going. And I'm going to go back to kind of talking about the uh, the idea of these societies that are enclosed. Because we talked about that in Doubt Out the Stars. And this society, they tell you at the get-go, they're on a space station. It is a rotating space station. They tell you about the different sectors. But you get the idea that this is massive. A massive, massive space station. And that people are, like, there are gardens. There are farms. There are farms you can't see the ends of. Like, massive. This is a planet, essentially, is their flying in. So society in space, but they actually know they're in space. Yes. It's it's not as straddling of sci-fi fantasy. It's more sci-fi. This is definitely hard sci-fi. And I will put it in the high sci-fi, hard sci-fi. Well, I guess, okay, it's high fantasy, hard sci-fi, right? When we talk yes. about, yes, that, we got to talk about that too. But anyway. Well, high is like, it, in, as in like royals. So it's high fantasy is the very fantasy. I don't know. I'm thinking of explanations that aren't real. I don't know why yeah. we call anything what we call it. But yes, high fantasy is what is the term. And then, and then I think hard it's sci-fi. hard sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, is the, but also I think hard sci-fi also has branches off because there's like military sci-fi and there's like stuff like that. Yeah, so with, um, with Medusa Uploaded, I mean, this was like one of the 10 best sci-fi fantasy books of 2018. Wow. It was like, it got all kinds of like accolades and stuff like that. This, this book is amazing. It, I think it was, yeah, this one was a finalist for the Philip K. Dick Award. Uh, this, this is, wait, not this one, another one that she wrote. She's okay. just, that's why she's so cool. Like she's got all these awards, she's amazing. Okay, so this one, the main character connects to this machine. And I'm going to try not to give as much away in this one. Because You're not going to spoil it. No, I'll probably spoiler it when I read the second one. <laughs> um, but I'm going to try not to be too spoilery in it, but I'm going to give some stuff away just because I want to talk about why it's, why it's very sci-fi and what the cover has to do with it. So uh, I'm going to start with the cover with this one. So the character finds this machine and she like becomes one with it. Is that the uploading? Yeah. Yeah. She, so what happens is basically there are these two space stations and I'm not giving anything away. I'm kind of prefacing. There are these two space stations and Oichi and her family were all on one of them. And she was transferred to this space station that's still around. And the other one was blown up and they say it was an accident. Air quotes. Oh. Accident. And she goes on to find out that it wasn't, and there's this big conspiracy. And much like in Doubt Not the Stars, there's this whole like uh, hierarchy of people. And Oichi is like a nobody. I kind of get the feeling she's not fully human either. Is it like cyborgs or is it like aliens? I think it's a little bit of all those things. Okay. I'm really getting the feeling that these 
people are not really people that okay. they're the humanoid yeah humanoid they were very created but yet they give birth to each other so oh. i i don't know there's a lot of stuff that goes on maybe it's just their brains have been i don't know I, like i said i read this book a while ago and even though i absolutely loved it and the big the big picture stuff i still remember uh, there's a lot of stuff I forgot. Details are a little fuzzy right now. But um, I do remember that there are some, there's the Medusas, the Medusa units that are these like, they're big tentacled robotic things that do all kinds of cool stuff. And she kind of becomes an assassin. And she starts assassinating political figures in this hierarchy in order to manipulate a revolution. And she starts pulling in other people to be hooked up to these Medusa units. And there's something in her brain that was uploaded as a music file, uh, a music library. And, but that has a secret code in it that allows them to be uploaded into the Medusas. And I think that's the coolest thing. And if you follow Emily on Facebook, she does a Medusa playlist every day. So she has a song that she plays <laughs> kind of every day that is apparently from the Medusa unit. Music plays a massive role in this book. And I'm going to say, if you are not a music fan, and I mean like in the general sense of music, you're probably going to miss some of the nuance mm. of why she's picking these songs. I had to go look up a couple of them. And my taste in music does kind of span the spectrum. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a music fan, in the sense of like, oh, I know all of these little details about this music. It's more like, oh, I know that song. Right. Or right. I know that music. And I know everything from classical to pop to rock to heavy metal to, you know, kind of all this different stuff. So the music plays a major role. So if you're not a music fan or you have to look up this music, I would recommend kind of keeping your phone next to you. Or if you read it on an ebook, have your phone at the ready to look up these songs because it's valuable. I like a soundtrack with it. Yes, there's like a soundtrack that kind of goes with this, which is really cool. I love that. Just going to gush, gush again about how cool it is to have a soundtrack to go with your book. And I know we've kind of touched on like you shouldn't have musical lyrics and things like that in books. That's kind of a dangerous land to tread on because you could get copyright issues. Yeah, it's a music and books is a weird thing. I can only think the only example I can think of of a book that actually uses like actual musical lyrics in it is um, Good Opens. Oh, yes. They actually use Queen lyrics in the book and they had to like actually give credit and everything to the recording company and everything. And then when the show came out, they actually got all Queen music, which must have been really expensive, but Amazon made it so they could afford it. Yeah. But I think a lot of authors kind of do that, though, where they'll be like, this is the song that I was thinking of when this thing happened and connect it in your brain because you can go listen to it on Spotify. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I would love to do that with some of my books, too. But like, it's it means so much in this book. Like when when she's doing something, she talks about what song is playing in the Medusa unit and how that connects to her brain. I have another cat that just joined me. Did you hear him? Yeah. <laughs> so now Solaris has joined us. Um, yeah, he's talking. Anyway, so, oh, but that will lead me to talking about how there's like little Medusa units that the next generation of the like revolution starts to build. So these kids are uploaded with this new information and they start building Medusa units that are tiny and like get into things. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of like, do you remember Digimon? Vaguely, yes. Pokemon's less popular cousin. Yes, Pokemon's yeah. less popular cousin. They had to do with like these little digital creatures that they connected to and all this stuff. And that's kind of what this reminded me of is they have these Medusa units that they're connected to and they're big and they got all these tentacles and they're really scary. And then there's these cute little like chibi units that, <laughs> that are like, I'm just here to help. <laughs> so I love this because I do feel like it bridges a generation with talking hard sci-fi and assassins and using robotics in this way and kind of the conspiracy and intrigue and all of the things that go with that mm -hmm. and the politics of it all and then she talks about these little chibi units and I'm like all of a sudden I'm in an anime and I'm giggling <laughs> about it and and it's and it's done so well that the first time like the first time she introduces these units I'm like oh that's kind of cool and then as I'm reading further I'm going 
I totally just got like trolled here because I'm reading an anime now. <laughs> to be fair, all of these elements could be in an anime. Yes, it's a little bit Gundam-esque too because like they're they're one with their units and and they all can communicate together and all this stuff. And oh my god, and they can make all the Medusas look slightly different. Yes. Like they yes. can be like have different colors and their tentacles could look different. Yeah, there's all this stuff. Like there's there's a lot of personalization to some of these things. So and they they all have different names and the names have meanings and yeah there's there's a lot to remember in this book. So yeah the fuzzy details are a thing right now which will allow me to not spoil things. But what I really loved about this is that, especially reading it, I think I read it at the same time as I read Down Out the Stars. I got really heavy into sci-fi for a minute there. Because the other book that I read during this time was 1Q84, which is also like parallel universe sci-fi. A little different. Yeah, but it that one definitely screwed with my brain. When we talk about that one, I don't know how much I'm going to talk about with that one. I will mm-hmm. talk about the cover. I will talk about some things, but yeah. I don't know. What I do want to compare on these two, though, is this one has a very sci-fi, and this one is Doubt Not the Stars. So Doubt Not the Stars has a very crossover. We talked about it in the episode. It it can be sci-fi. It leans heavy fantasy, and it's trying to trick you. Other way around. But You said it leans heavy fantasy, but it could be sci-fi. The other way around, right? Other way around. Yeah. Yes. Scratch that, reverse it. Yeah. Um, and it's trying to trick you. From the get-go, Sarah is talking about how this is a society that is falling apart and their dogma and structure is what is killing them. And it doesn't talk about the fact that they're on a space station. Giant mm-hmm. spoiler. This one, which is Medusa uploaded, which my screen went dark as I was talking about it. There is no joke. We are sci-fi. Right. She is not hiding the fact that they're on a space station. She is not hiding the fact that they are a society crumbling because the space station is not going to hold up very much longer kind of thing. They have to make their mission count. They have to get to a destination. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen. And the whole conspiracy in it is that the hierarchy, the higher levels of this, are trying to keep it a big secret that things are falling apart and we're running out of food and we're running out of supplies and we're running out of this and that and things are not going well. Kind of like what a society dogmatically falling apart would do anyway. And at the end of this one, it's okay. So this is the giant spoiler on this one. Sorry. The end of this one leads into Medusa in the graveyard, which is them getting to the graveyard. The graveyard is talked about a lot in this one, but they don't get there yet. The adventure is going to be getting to the graveyard in the next one. Mm -hmm. I haven't read the next one, but I'm super, super excited about it. You know what I think is interesting though, is you say that um, Down Out the Stars is that it's sci-fi, it's definitely sci-fi, but it's also kind of fantasy, whereas Medusa uploaded is straight sci-fi. But you still get the mythological element in it, in that your robots are called Medusas. Yes. And even the design of the robot looks like the mythical Medusa. Mm -hmm. The robot on the cover has like these tentacles on her head, but like Medusa has snakes. Yes. So the Medusa units, when she describes them, they're more spider-like. Um, so you do kind of lose that, that heavy Medusa symbolism in it. But the cover art leans into it. Yeah, the cover art leans heavily into the Medusa idea of things. Have you seen the cover for Medusa in the Graveyard? Yes. It kind of does too, into the mythological. Yes, and I feel like it leans a little more fantasy. It does. It's got this big like, you see like the cords and you see like machinery in the background. You see this big claw, but it's holding what almost looks like a mythical goblet. Yes. And the first time I saw it, if I hadn't read Medusa uploaded and seen the cover of that, I would think Medusa in the graveyard was fantasy. The machinery elements make me think it's sci-fi, but this cup that's like holding looks like fire. There's like a moon in it. It looks like a moon in it. Yeah. It's almost like that like flame of Olympus kind of thing. So I don't know if that was just, we, maybe if we ever get to talk to her about it, we can ask her if she knows. I don't know a, you know, how involved she was in her cover art. I, I think in this one, she, I don't know. Yeah. Cause this is a, this is tour. This is a tour book. So this oh, is like. Oh, so she didn't. 
I, I don't know. She might have. I don't know. I don't know how much control Tor gives you. Tor is like the big sci-fi fantasy publisher. Yeah. Um, most of your big sci-fi fantasy authors go through Tor. Um, Robert Jordan, I'm pretty sure, was all through Tor. Brandon Sanderson's all through Tor. It's the it's the biggie. So I don't know how much say she had in her covers, but I feel like her artist leaned into that it's tech, it's sci-fi, but there's a mythological element to it too. Yeah. It doesn't really sound like the story leans into that other than they're named after the Medusa. Well, there there is kind of that, I feel like the tearing down of society and the revolution kind of thing. And they, oh, they also all kind of hang out in Lucifer Tower, which is a, a section of the uh, uh, space station. And I don't remember the names of the space station, but I feel like those were, I feel like one was like the Titan and one was the Olympian. I don't know. I have to look it up again. I'm so sorry. Some of this stuff got blurry. I mean, we, we do that. We do that as a society. All of our spaceships yeah. and stuff are named, you know, in our cities and our towns and all that kind of stuff. It's that kind of backward thinking thing to name your forward thinking objects after, you know, the legends of old kind of a thing. Well, yeah it, yeah, it maintains a connection to our culture. Right. Is really what that is. And a lot of this is, it's about connecting to culture. What I think is interesting in this too, is that there are so many societies and cultures represented in this book. She really does try to take a microcosm of all Earth's cultures and put them into the space station and what would that look like um she talks about how earth is probably not even real and that you know we are not actually from earth is what these characters are talking about there is no earth there never was an earth we were never on earth so there's some weird stuff going on there too earth truthers yeah they're earth truthers there's got to be something going on with that i'm so excited that's gonna be something i think you'll see in your second book yeah. yeah, I'm so excited. Like, I'm ridiculously excited about this book. The cover on this, that's kind of the connection I wanted to make between the two, is that this one knows it is sci-fi and wants you to know that it's sci-fi with no secrets and no, no, like, oh, no, it's just a society that's crumbling, not we're a society in space and we don't know it. But, like, the fantasy sort of aspect with it, which, again, I guess it's not really fantasy. In a way, you mentioned uh, Mortal Instruments when we were talking about, or Mortal Engines. Mortal Engines. I always do that. Always Mortal do Instruments that. is the other one. I know. It's the other one. And I'm, I always do that. In Mortal Engines, you have the societies and cultures of those moving cities that harken back to what would be our modern time. Right. And the societies and cultures that are represented in this futuristic society are very much of our modern time. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things that I'm seeing in this that are like, oh, well, maybe that's because they're actually just programmed that way. And it's so much about programming and so much about being uploaded into something or having your brain, like you just dock in and get something new new features, new things like that. So that's why I'm kind of feeling like these characters aren't human. Mm -hmm. They're not human either. The Medusa units are clearly not human, but these creatures that we think are people are not people either. And like, is the Medusa unit then kind of the next step up? I see. Or are the Medusa units the ones in charge? And are they the ones that created this? There's all kinds of stuff going on. It also goes into a lot of like the mask of this. So like you can see that the unit has got a human face, mm -hmm. but it doesn't move and it doesn't really talk. I don't, maybe it does. I don't know. It's hard to tell. But it's like you don't recognize a face. This is the computer's face and yours is part of it underneath. That's a, a really interesting thing. So I love the little on the cover. It says the executives control Oichi's life until the day they kill her. And so they think that they've killed this main character and now she's coming back as this and she's become an assassin and she kills off all these people. also an element in the mortal engines books <laughs> yeah i know it's really cool but and we talked about the font on the other one this one is definitely a sci-fi font it's your blocky sci-fi font yeah blocky sci-fi and neon 
neon green. Uh, Medusa in the graveyard is more of a yellow color. It is kind of a cool color scheme to it, though. Like, that, too, I think the color scheme leans more into sci-fi, too, because it's this... It's like a grayscale color scheme with that bright title. Yeah. And I'm going to bring up Medusa in the graveyard again. You say that it looks like machinery in the background. I don't know. It looks like kind of like a, it could be a temple too. Yes. It has a very temple-like look and it is. It's like holding a goblet and- But it's a claw holding a goblet. It's like a mechanical claw. Is it mechanical or is it sword? It looks mechanical. I don't know. See, and I would ask, like, if if ever we get a chance to talk to her, I'd ask if it feels to me like the cover designer leaned into that. It's sci-fi, but it's also sort of mythology kind of a thing. And I wonder if that's, when, when was this published? When was Medusa uploaded published? Um, 2018, 2018. And this one's 2019. So these are brand new books. Um. Oh, I found it. Uh, the one that survived, the um, the ship that survived is the Olympia. Because these almost remind me, see if I can find the cover for you and then I will share it with you. It, it almost slightly reminds me of this. And this is why I wonder for a moment if this is what they're trying to do. Not her, not her, but the publishers. It just for a moment r- reminds me of this. <gasps> it does. It totally does remind of the the Cinder Chronicles thing, Lunar yes. Chronicles. The yes. Cinderella shoe with a robot foot in it. Yeah. It almost reminds me because that these books are popular and because it's a trend to kind of do this modern retellings of fairy tale and mythology. I almost wonder if that's what the cover art is leaning into. It could be. It could be. But I really hope that Emily sees this and and decides that she wants to be interviewed by us because I will geek out so hard. Yeah. Um, you may have to run that interview because I may be like, like stupid. Emily, here's all the questions Jen wanted to ask you. <laughs> Maybe it would be easier if it's on a Zoom thing. I don't know. We'll see. If she's sitting in the same room, I'm, I don't know. I really do like, I geek out over these people. But I do want to know like how much pull she has with a bigger publisher. Yeah with the book cover so she would be a really great one to talk to absolutely but so someone who like most of the authors we've talked to are self or small press published mm-hmm. so and tor like i said tor is a big in yeah so i would really like and i don't know how much she can tell us because she's published by tor but like it would be really interesting to see some inside of an author's point of view working with what the biggest fantasy publisher and how much influence there is on what goes on that cover. So you say stuff like that, like biggest fantasy publisher, and it doesn't make it easier for me to be like, I oh, don't know, it's cool, we're neighbors, we can hang out. Because <laughs> I am not published by the biggest no, fantasy publisher. but the thing is, you know, <laughs> the thing about going through tour is there's advantage to it because it's tour, and there's mm-hmm. disadvantage because it's not yours. Yeah. I know Sanderson, most of his stuff has the same cover designer, but I don't know if that's a thing where you get to say, I like this cover designer, and then they decide if you get to work with them or not. Or like, I don't know where that line is of, I mean, it is nice because you get the bigger budgets and you get the better art designers and it's not all Photoshop and it's, because that is a gorgeous cover. It is a beautiful it cover. Is. Both of them. Both the covers are absolutely gorgeous. It's a beautiful cover that leans into a metaphor that maybe has nothing to do with the story. You know? <laughs> uh, the first one I would say definitely does. And it makes it very personal because the way she describes some of these assassinations, it's very in your face yeah. kind of thing. And I kind of feel like this thing is coming out after me. When you look at the cover, it's like, whoa, okay, that, that's coming for me. And this is the last thing I get to see. So like, you know, it's a little bit creepy um, in the same way as like when she picks her revolutionaries, they get very up close and personal with the unit before they come one of it. And so like, I, I like that it's, you have a choice when you're looking into this cover and you're looking into this face that's going to get you. Are you joining the revolution or is this the last thing you're going to see? Right. And I think that's really cool. I I definitely recommend this book. And I will talk briefly that the next one we'll probably talk about is uh, 1Q84, which I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about that one.
Maybe it depends on when this episode goes out. Yes. It might be the next one you talk about. It might not be the next one anyone hears. Yes, that's true. Our um, episodes are all kind of out of order when we when we when we record because we record based on when we've read things and have time to record and release. We try to have our episodes somewhat relevant to each other when they release. So sometimes we record an episode on something that is way out there and we have to wait until we have something else that's similar-ish to go with it. No more recording episodes so far after I've read a book, especially a book I really enjoyed because I really had so much more I really wanted to say about this book and I it would have been way too much for me to try to figure it all out again. Maybe we revisit this when you read the sequel. Yes. Or if we, not a whole episode, maybe Jen, what we'll do is after um, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor comes out and I read that and you read Medusa in the Graveyard, we'll have a follow-up episode on on our anticipated sequels. I like that. Maybe oh my gosh, we'll yes. Do. We'll do a sequel episode. Yeah. Oh, oh, that would be good. It would be like the revenge of the sequels or something. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll, we'll come back and be like, so if, if we want to do that, what are, do you have any predictions based on the cover for the next book? I think I kind of already said it, but I, they are going to talk about, they talk about these colossals or the colossi in the, in the first book that they're going to wake these sleeping giants. Mm. And so with that, that, claw and that orb kind of sitting in there I feel like you know when that orb hits that chalice is when like everything wakes up or vice versa they put the orb in the chalice and all of a sudden things activate and it comes floating out and like all this stuff happens you know how that goes yeah Uh, yeah it's it's you put the battery in and all of a sudden all these things wake up well yeah we'll have to revisit this and and beautifully foolish endeavor and see how how good our skills are in predicting things about a book based on the cover. Yes. And, and what we know of the author, but yeah, Emily does some really cool stuff here in the Valley too, which hopefully if, if she'll like subject herself to an interview with us, (laughs) because we do get a little weird when we interview people. Um, Just in general. We do not. I don't know. I think Emily would probably disagree. (laughs) I would argue we do not get any weirder with other people on this podcast than we do when we're alone. This is, okay, yeah. And Ovley doesn't count because she's around this in real life. Yes, she's actually friends with us, like, on a day-to-day. She's been in our homes. Yeah, she's she's dealt with our weird enough. Yes, she understands us. And Bob, too. Bob totally understands our weird because, you know... I wrote with him. Talking about sequels, I'm not going to say that there's going to be a sequel to Cloud to Cloud, but there may be some outlines happening, but that won't be for another year. When you're done with like book seven of this series, I might have chapter four of my book done. (laughs) No, you're going to say it right. No. You have to. You got to start doing some books, Mary. No, because then people would actually read stuff that I write and that's no bueno. See, don't tell me that you have imposter, that I have imposter syndrome it's not imposter syndrome it's this is for me not for you <laughs> you're so selfish yes i'm selfish oh <laughs> uh, all right so that is our talk of of sci-fi and sequels and uh, um writing and outline and i was really trying to be poetic right there and it what blah so yeah <laughs> that was a b- beautiful segue <laughs> Just unplug the audio. Just just shut me off. That's that's just hit the mute button whenever I do something weird. Yeah, I could do that too. I've got, oh I could God. do that. Mary has control of me. Mary is the Medusa. She. I don't need to mute you. I can just edit you out later. It's fine. <laughs> Mary has full control of me. That's that's a scary thought. For for an hour every two weeks, I have full control of you. Yes. All right. But you you told us we were on a time limit and we are reaching that time limit. Yes, yes, we are. I'm going to say that is all I have to say about Medusa Uploaded until we talk to Emily and talk about Medusa in the graveyard. All right. Does that is that it? Are we all yeah. done? Do we have any more recommendations? To- Do we want to say anything else? I think we've already re- done our recommendations because we're talking about sequels. Yeah, that's true. We go read those books. Go read those before these come out and yes. you have plenty of time. For, before we revisit in our, se- our sequel follow-up episode. Yeah. I'm so excited to read the sequel. Then stop playing with that. All right. My cat's getting in trouble. I gotta go. All right. And I will let you go. All right. That's all. That's all. That's, that's all she wrote. All. That's Goodbye. all she wrote. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for cracking another case with Mary and Jen. 
To learn more about Casing the Cover, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Casing the Cover. To contact us or suggest a book, email casingthecoverpod at gmail.com. New episodes of Casing the Cover release the second and fourth Tuesday on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.